Well, hello, grade twelves. Welcome to a uh, a new unit, a brand new unit. Congratulations on getting through the last unit. <laughs> um, yeah, listen, we've got uh, we've got something new to talk about today, and so I'm I'm gonna just keep it short. There's a couple of worksheets. Two, and this is the subject of our next little quiz, okay, which will come up uh, early next week. So, anyway, take a look at this, okay? Um, momentum and impulse, okay? So the, the the unit we're on now is called momentum and energy, okay? But the first lesson is momentum and impulse. So, um, sorry, I didn't have time to make better notes than this, but uh, anyway, it's good enough, okay? <laughs> so. First of all, we're going to define something new today. It's called momentum, and momentum is a quantity of motion. Okay, and a quantity of motion, that's kind of a weird definition, but uh, listen, in order to have momentum, you just have to have two things. Those two things are mass and velocity. Okay, if something has zero velocity, it has no momentum. We use the letter P to represent momentum in physics. Okay, so P equals mass times velocity. It's a vector and it has the same direction as the velocity. Okay, so that's what momentum is. You can kind of think of it like, um, you know, like let's say you had a ping pong ball that's traveling at 10 meters per second east and a, you know, cannonball, okay, which is much larger and heavier, traveling at 10 meters per second east. You kind of instinctively get a sense of what momentum means if you imagine catching those two things, okay? Um, yeah, one of them has a lot more motion simply because it has a lot more mass, okay? And that's what momentum is all about. It's just this product of mass and velocity. Uh, oddly, it doesn't have a special unit. Uh, the units are just base uh, physics units, kilograms times meter per second, because mass is in kilograms, right? masses in kilograms and um, velocities in meters per second. All right, so impulse then, that's what momentum is, okay? So momentum is mass times velocity. Impulse is defined as a change in momentum. And what I've done here is I've kind of developed it for you. Um, impulse does not have a variable that we give to impulse. I just write the word out usually. And it's equal to delta P, which is the change of momentum. Now, normally your mass doesn't change when your momentum is changing, but your velocity can change. And so the change in momentum would be defined as mv prime minus mv. Now, let me explain what v prime is. I know it's a weird notation. Normally, we used to say, I'll just put in brackets here, v2 and v1, right? v2 for final velocity, v one for initial velocity. We're going to change that now. We use what's called the prime notation. Prime means final. Okay. Now a prime is like a little single quote next to the variable. Okay. Now these are vectors as well. I guess I should put that in there. But this is just mv2. Here I'm going to put a two and a one here. It's kind of like mv2 minus mv1, but we're going to not put the two and the one. So I'm going to get rid of those. V prime means V, the final velocity. V means the initial velocity. So this expression here is the final momentum here minus the initial momentum there. Okay? And that's equal to the change in momentum. Now, a couple things to consider. So I wrote consider this. Let's say you have a net force F that's acting on an object, and therefore that object accelerates in the direction of that force. Okay, so we know from Newton's second law that F equals M8. So we know this. This is something now we're very familiar with. We also know that acceleration is equal to the change in velocity divided by the change in time. Now, okay, actually I normally don't write delta T, so I'll just let me write T. Okay, time is always an interval anyway. So now we're going to use the prime notation, right, the final velocity here. V, v prime minus the initial velocity V. And I know that's strange notation, trust me, comes in handy very soon, okay? And then we divide this by time, and that's equal to the acceleration. Well, if I substitute that into the acceleration in F equals MA, 
I get this, and I, again, I'm going to erase the delta notation. I'm going to fix this a little. Okay, you end up getting that the force, the net force or whatever acting on the object, is equal to m times the change in velocity, right? So this is m a, except we're just substituting in the definition of a, which is v prime delta v over t, right? All right then, uh, I got rid of the delta, so let me change this note a little, fix this. Oh, these notes are, I was tired when I wrote it, that's why. All right, so here, that gives us this equation here. Okay, that the force times the time, if I just cross multiply my equation here and move that time up there to the other side by cross multiplying it, I find that force times time, so that's this here, is equal to mv prime minus mv, which is the change in momentum. Now this, what I just put in the box, is the various ways of calculating impulse. Since impulse is a change in momentum, it's also equal to force times time. Now the units of impulse would be in kilograms times meter per second, just like momentum. Or we see that that is equivalent to Newton seconds. Okay, because force times time here is in Newtons times seconds. Well, that is equivalent to kilograms times meter per second. Okay, all right. Now, uh, there's a new law that we'd like to talk to you about, and this one is kind of a, a very interesting law. It'll allow us to do problems we've never seen before. So it's called the Law of Conservation of Momentum. Now, what that law says, and I was very tired when I wrote this. I can tell by how, how sloppy my writing is. Normally sloppy, but not this sloppy. Anyway, it says in isolated systems, so that's isolated systems, okay, which I underlined and bolded there, um, Isolated system means there's no external unbalanced forces acting on the system. Okay. Watch what happens here. Okay. So if you only have forces internal, like let's say you're playing pool on a pool table. Well, one thing about a pool table is that the normal force and the force of gravity acting on all the balls cancels out. And so those are external forces, but they cancel out. And so when the balls hit each other, it's really only the internal forces between those balls okay, that, that gives rise to the motion you see on the pool table. And so let's take two objects, A and B. Okay, and here you can see A is colored red, B is colored uh, blue, and they're moving in opposite directions, so they're going to hit and collide. Now, during the collision, they exert forces on each other. This is the force of B on A. Now that is this vector right, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. That's this vector right here. That is the force of B pushing on block A, pushing it to the left, okay? Now block B is it gonna experience a force because of block A. So this is the force of A on block B, and that is to the right. Now this is an action reaction okay action reaction pair of forces these two forces and because they are an action reaction pair we can look at newton's third law and we can say listen these forces have to be equal but op opposite right so one is the negative of the other now what this means is i'm going to call block a I'm going to erase this and write it again because I really don't like the writing I used here. I'm going to call block A mass number one. Okay, and see, I can, I've labeled them mass number one. So I'm going to write M181, okay, equals negative M2A2. So they each have their own mass and their own acceleration, right? All right, well, I'm going to substitute in for A1 the delta V over T thing that we did above. So it's M1, and I'm going to use the prime notation, V1 prime minus V1. So here, like, that is the final velocity of mass 1. So that's the final after the collision of the two masses. And this is the initial, okay, velocity before the collision. And here, for mass 2, this expression this is the final velocity 
of mass 2, and this is the initial velocity of mass 2. Okay, now what you'll notice is, let me here, let me fix that on the bottom. What you'll notice is that time actually cancels out, and I've already canceled it out on that side, because it occurs on both sides. And of course, they are colliding with each other at the same amount of time, right? Now, what I'm going to do with this equation, I'm just going to, just to make this video shorter, okay? What, I, what you do is you take, you expand the brackets by multiplying the mass times everything that's in the brackets. And then what you do is you bring all the primes to one side, okay? You bring all the primes to one side, and you can see it here. There's M1 V1 prime and M2 V2 prime. Now, that is the final momentum in the system. Whoops. The final momentum of the system is the sum of those two things. It's this is the final velocity of mass number one, and that's our red mass, so that's the final momentum of it. And this is our blue mass, that's its final momentum. Now, this is the on the other side is the initial momentum. Have a hard time. I'm not at a desk. It makes it hard to do this. Let me see if I can do it a little better. It's the initial momentum of the system. Okay, on the on the right hand side of that equation, and so we see that the final momentum is equal to the initial momentum. Like the sum of the final momentum is equal to the initial momentum, and that what I just put in the box is referred to as the law of conservation of momentum. So in any system, isolated system, the final momentum equals the initial momentum. And what we mean is for typically things like collisions. Okay? Final momentum equals initial momentum. Although it's not just collisions. Okay? Like, um, let's say if you've ever stepped into a canoe... What you'll notice is in the canoe, and I'll draw a little picture of a canoe here. Let's say here's your canoe, okay, and you're having a nice time sitting in the water. You're standing over here in the canoe. Okay. Now, let's say you decide to walk this way. What the canoe will do in response to that is go... Uh, here, I'll use the color red. It'll go, uh, I'll put it here. It'll go the other way. So you walk this way. Let's call that V1. Okay. And this is V2. What the other guy will do is move the other way. Okay. And so it does that to conserve momentum. Okay. So you're exerting a force on the canoe, like to the left. It's exerting a force on you to the right. And then what happens is that you move and the canoe moves. Okay, but you don't move at the same rate. It depends on the differences of mass. Like if the canoe is replaced by this ginormous cruise ship, then the cruise ship does not move any appreciable amount at all. Okay, so anyway, that's the law of conservation of momentum. Now, that's basically it for the lesson for today. All I have to do now is just show you what assignment I put in here. So I put two worksheets. One of them, okay, is uh, this worksheet on impulse. So let me just show you how to do a couple of those. Okay, it says here a rocket at rest with a mass of 9.5 times 10 to the 3 kilograms is acted on by an average net force, okay, of 1.5 times 10 to the 5 newtons upwards for 15 seconds. What's the final velocity of the rocket? Now, what, I'm, what I put in the margin here is uh, the a typical equation that you could use to solve that. See, impulse is equal to force times time but it's also equal to change in momentum. So let's say you are doing question number one, okay, and you're looking for the final velocity. Now, for some of you, you could say, oh, I'll just use F equals MA, and then use the motion equation. Actually, you could do that, and it would work because these laws are all self-consistent. So that's another way of doing it, but this is just the momentum and impulse way. So it's a new way of doing it, so let's do it that way. Okay, so what they're saying in question one, is that the mass is, oh, I'm sorry, looking at the wrong thing, 9.5 times 10 to the 3 
So the mass is 9,500 kilograms, right? They're saying that a rocket is at rest, so that means V equals zero, okay? Uh, and then the net force is 1.5 times 10 to the 5 newtons. Well, 1.5 times 10 to the 5 newtons is 150,000, okay, um, newtons. And then it's upwards. We'll treat that as positive. I'm sorry, my... It's very difficult to write on this tablet sitting on a couch. Okay, so this is up like that. Now, what you're looking for is V prime, the final velocity. They give you time, 15 seconds. So the force acts for 15 seconds. Okay, so what you do now is we're going to use the highlighted equation here that I highlighted up here that you see in yellow. Okay. So, what you do is you go force times time equals mv prime minus mv. Now just go ahead and substitute everything. 150,000 times 15 equals 9,500 v prime minus 0 because v is 0, so that one is gone, right? v is 0, don't forget. Now I just solve it for V prime. And when I do that, I get 150,000 times 15 equals divided by 9,500. I get 236.8. So it's 236.8 meters per second up since I got a positive number. And that's how you do it. it pretty straightforward, right? Like all you're doing using this given equation okay that's all you have to do now uh, let's try another one random okay um, number six is almost identical to that you know what I'm gonna let you try these because I'm telling you right now if this takes you a half an hour I'd be surprised it's really not that long You'll see the answers, by the way, at the bottom, like there's the one we just did. So you can check your answers there. All right, now let's take a look at question 10 because I didn't mention how it works with a graph. When you have a moment, uh, sorry, a force versus time graph, because impulse is equal to the product of force and time, because it's like that, that means in a variable force, it's equal to the area under the FT graph. Whoops. So that means that this area in here, this whole thing is the impulse. Okay, that, that area, A, equals impulse. Now we've done the area underneath the line before when we did displacement on a velocity time graph. Well this is a different kind of graph but whatever it's equal to the impulse right? So if you want to do this question it says the object has an initial velocity whoops sorry of I was tapping on the wrong thing an initial velocity of five meters per second that's not a negative five let me fix this five meters per second east, what is its final velocity? So what you're going to do is you're going to say that the impulse equals the change in momentum, which is mv prime minus mv. And you're going to say that that's equal to the area. So area equals mv prime minus mv. Now if you read the question, it says v is five. They're looking for v prime here. This one is v. And the mass is up at the top 1.2 kilograms. So we have everything we need. We have to work out the area, which is a rec, uh, you know a square or a rectangle on a, a triangle. Total it up, and, and there you go. All right. So that's how you do impulse questions. Very straightforward. Now let's do momentum questions. Momentum questions are also pretty straightforward. Um, 
the first question is like impulse. It says, what is the change in momentum? And change in momentum is mv prime minus mv. Okay. Now, it says, okay, so there's a bunch of change in momentum questions, so I'll leave those to you. It's pretty straightforward. Be careful of your directions, though, because they are vectors. So if a ball is moving east and then turns and moves west after a hit, well, then both of those directions can't, they can't both be positive, right? Let's look at number four. And I'd like to finish this instructional video with question four. It says a 30 kilogram object. Now, we're going to call this M1, okay? Is moving to the right. So it's moving to the right at a velocity of one meter per second. We're going to call that V1. It collides with another mass that we're going to call M2, moving to the left, so it's a head-on collision with a velocity of 5 meters per second. Now we're going to call that one V2. Okay, so all the subscripts, the number 2 subscripts, means that it goes with object 2. Now what it says is that M2, the 20 kilogram object, that's M2, right? I'm sorry. Let me make that better. M2 here continues to move to the left at a velocity of 1.25 meters per second. So now it has lowered its velocity, but it's still to the left at 1.25 meters per second. So it, it was moving at 5. Now it's moving at 1.25. And the question is, what is the final velocity of the 30 kilogram object? Now, by the way, pardon me, this moving to the left at 1.25 is V, since, since the 20 kilogram mass is M2, we're going to call it V2 prime. That's its final velocity. Okay. And what they're asking us for is V1 prime, the final velocity of our 30 kilogram mass. All right, so how do you do this? Well, we're going to use conservation of momentum. So we're going to write this, M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime equals M1 V1 plus M2 V2. Now, I read the question. I'm like, now I'm going to plug in the numbers. So I'm going to treat left as positive. So I'm going to say left in question, what number is this, number four? I'm going to say in question four, I'm going to say left is plus. Okay, now that means the one velocity that was to the right, which is V1, is going to be negative one meters per second. So now I just go ahead and plug in the numbers. I'm going to say 30 times V1 prime plus 20 times 1.25. And remember that that's what uh, V1 prime was. Okay. Equals M1 V1. Now here I'm going to write 30 times negative 1 because we said anything moving to the right has a negative 1 and the left is positive. And that's going to be plus 20 times 5. Okay, and there's only one unknown. There she blows, right? Like that's the one. So what you do is just, it's just simple algebra, right? So I'm going to go 30 times negative 1 plus 20 times 5, 70. And then I'm going to go minus 20 times 1.25. Just move it to the other side. I get 45 and then I divide that by 30. Okay, and what I get is 1.5 meters per second. So I get V, sorry, I had the highlighter turned on. I get V1 prime equals 1.5 meters per second. And since it's positive, it's left. Okay, and that is how you use conservation of momentum so let me put a little rainbow around that. That's how you do questions like number four involving collisions. And we've never really looked at collisions before, so it's kind of interesting. New kind of question. And you'll see several collisions here. 
Now, I will ask you not to do the two-dimensional problems, please. So let me just point this out. Don't do this. Not yet. Okay? We'll get there, but we need another lesson to get there. Okay, so please don't do that yet. We will do that on Friday. So this will be Friday's work. We'll get to there. Okay, and let's uh, just concentrate on the, the first two. Now there are answers somewhere here. I did not post them, but I will. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They're right there. Yeah, I, I missed it, but they're right at the end of the question. Pardon me, I, I was wrong. Um, yeah, right here. There's your answer. 1.5 meters per second left. Look at that, how good I am at this, right? 1.5 meters per second left. All right, that's it. Okay, so that's our uh, lesson for today. Congratulations on finishing Unit 1, and now we're moving on to Unit 2. I think, uh, you know, I think uh, you'll get it. Like, it's this, this first lesson in, the, in Unit 2 is pretty straightforward, even though it's something new. So now you've learned about momentum and impulse. And what we'll do is uh, we will continue looking at collisions and physics of collisions as we move forward. Okay. And otherwise, guys, have a good day, and I will see you soon. Oh, and quiz on this stuff early next week. I, I don't know when exactly. I'm thinking maybe we said that cohort A would go first this time. So next time I see cohort A, I believe is... Well, I see them on Friday, I think, but uh, yeah, so maybe Tuesday next week. Tuesday next week for a quiz on this. All right, guys, have a good one. We'll talk to you soon.